Hi, Dr. Candy. My name is Claudia Chiappa. I'm joined here by my colleague, Abu Kamara. We're both journalism graduate students at Boston University. As a, a person of color, um, existing while striving for racial equity can sometimes be exhausting. And particularly today, when we think about the trial of Derek Chauvin in Minneapolis, in moments like this, how do you remain committed to doing the work of anti-racism? I think it's, it's, it's in moments like this that I, I really reach out to um, and really sort of hug um, not only people that I love, but, but even the rights that we all love. Um, and and, and I, I think that fuel of sort of love allows me to really get through the, the difficult moments, the, the, the adversity, but also even outrage uh, that even a, and on a day like today where it's, it's going to be pretty apparent that the, the Derek Chauvin's defense is going to be putting George Floyd on trial, that outrage even sort of pushes me through. The, the, you know, just as the people who watched him be murdered were outraged, right? You know, you, you just can't stop. You, you can't even really think about yourself. You, you know, you have to sort of be focused on 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 on, on bringing justice. Um, I think if there is a guilty verdict, I I, I, I suspect uh, people aren't going to be surprised either on some level because it it was obvious that this this officer should be guilty. But then again, I think people will be surprised. And I think people will then take the next step and continue to fight to ensure that policies and practices are in place that then never allow anybody to be killed uh, at the hands of police and certainly in the way George Floyd was. You know, as much as blaming the fact that we should have, this should have never been a case to begin with because George Floyd should be with her do- his daughter right now. We started talking about this trial that is so important that we're all looking at. And one year ago, after the killing of George Floyd, you wrote in uh, in an article in The Atlantic that we were living through a revolution, that it was the end of denial. But 30 years before that, there was Rodney King, and many hoped that that would be it. And sadly, it wasn't. Uh, What do you think it will take so that there isn't another name added to that list? So I I really think it's going to take a complete reimagining of public safety in this country. And and, and what I mean by that is what we currently have right now is a situation in which people across political parties, even across races, believe that there are these extremely dangerous Black neighborhoods with those dangerous Black people who need to be controlled by these militarized police forces and massive sort of prisons and and, and a suite of sort of laws, uh, you know, that criminalize and keep these, quote, animals in check. And, And then, so that's the larger societal perspective. And then police officers are then told to, quote, keep those so-called animals in check, and they're given qualified immunity, and they're allowed to be investigated by themselves, (laughs) right, when they do wrong. It is a conceptual or ideological system that connects Black people to danger, combined with all these policies that protect police officers when they act on that, um, that just completely needs to be transformed. In your book, you spend a lot of time defining terms like anti-racist, biological uh, biological racism, which words I previously had not heard of. Why did you feel it was so important to develop new language? A large part of our longstanding argument over racism, and specifically whether racism exists, and specifically who is being racist, is over definitions. And so to give an example, I mean, two years ago, when you have, for instance, a president sort of calling a majority Black Baltimore a rat and rodent infested mess where no human being would want to live in, 
And then the, the local congressman from, 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 from Baltimore uh, basically calling what the president said racist. And then the president responding by saying, I am the least racist person there is anywhere in the world. What is inherent in that? A different, completely different definitions of the term racist itself. And, and I think that, so I, I wanted to provide the American people with research-based sort of definitions, because how are we going to talk about race or racism? How are we even going to see it if we don't even know what it truly is, or if we're defining it in a way that always exonerates us or exonerates our nation, which is how people typically define these terms? Yes, racism is, is everywhere, it affects people everywhere geographically, and it really affects people of all ages. And that led me to think about, in particular, your work you published last year, Anti-Racist Baby. And I was curious, uh, why did you think that it was important to write a book that specifically introduced the idea of racism to young audiences? I think it's a combination of having a young daughter um, I have a four-year-old daughter, and and like with anything else, uh, whether it's how to you know potty train her, or you know whether it's understanding empathy or what it means to be kind, uh, we typically used books to introduce or to accelerate those conversations. I certainly wanted to to have a book to begin talking up to her about it, what it means to be anti-racist, and I think that combined with the data that shows that as early as three months, uh, babies start understanding race as a concept. So it really happens between three and nine months. And as early as two to three years old, you, you have children, for instance, deciding who to play with based on one's skin color and, and the way adults decide who's dangerous based on skin color. You have so many parents who, who are thinking that our kids are colorblind. You know, when, when that's not true, and all the while, study after study shows that when parents actively talk to their children um, about race, you know, actively teach them that, you know, look at all these different colors, and although they may be different, they're, they're, they're equal, they're part of this sort of same human rainbow that that actually causes the, the youngest of children to, in, in you know, more adult terms, be anti-racist. How early should parents start, you know, having those conversations about race with their children? And what should they look like? I mean, as early as possible. I mean, so let me give an example. Most parents, well, I would say probably almost all parents, start talking to their kids about what it means to be kind, <laughs> you know, before their kids can even talk. Kindness is an extremely complicated concept. <laughs> And, and, it, and it's the type of concept that what it means to be kind is potentially very different in a multitude of situations. And, and, and the reason why I'm emphasizing how sophisticated kindness is, is because you have parents who say, oh, well, it's just too sophisticated to talk to, to my kid about, about race. Kindness is sophisticated. <laughs> but a, a, along with this, I think it's important to know that even more impactful than what we say to our children is what we don't say, our nonverbal language. In, in, in other words, like a, a child sees when all of our friends are, let's say, you know, you're a white caretaker and, and all of your friends are white. Like a child sees that. You know, a child sees when, you know, you're walking down the street and a black male comes upon you and you get scared. A child senses that. That's a that you're you're saying something to that child. You know, a child sees, and indeed studies show that those children who grow up in homogenous neighborhoods, that that impacts their racial development, not in an anti-racist way. The issue of representation uh, goes beyond BU walls, and it's also in Boston. Uh, we were talking at the scenes. Our teaching assistant was telling us that she was she's a black woman, and she was specifically told not to come to Boston to study because of its reputation. And I am curious, what are your thoughts on Boston's racial reputation? I have lived in the United States my um, entire life, <laughs> and I have yet to live in a city um, that wasn't deeply racist. <laughs> um, 
I have led to live in a city that didn't have racial disparities and inequities and, and substantial ones at that. So I wasn't personally, um, I, I did not personally shy away from, um, let's say coming to, to Boston because of this label of, of it being a racist city. I lived in Washington, DC, it was a racist city. I lived in Philadelphia, I lived in, grew up in New York City. I've experienced and seen racism wherever I've lived along the East Coast. Um, what actually attracted me more though, was the 19th century history of, of Boston. And, 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 and Boston was one of, if not the cradle uh, of, of the abolitionist uh, movement. And, and you had everyone from uh, Mariah Stewart um, to um, William Lloyd Garrison to Wendell Phillips to, to Charles Sumner. And then, you know, going into after the end of slavery, we had people like W.E.B. Du Bois and, um, and, and of course, Martin Luther King and, and Malcolm X. And I mean, you name the pivotal important leader prior to the busing era, which of course really labeled this city um, you know, there were, there were so many great folks who, who, who came through this city and I just wanted to walk in, in their footsteps. And Abu and I, we represent the next wave of journalists. Uh, what would you like to see us do when it comes to conveying this idea of anti-racism? If journalists were willing to use the term racist when it's appropriate, <laughs> that would be a huge step forward for the field, right? Um, and, 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 if, and if journalists were willing to tell the truth, even when a particular political party, when they know the backlash would be, oh, that's, you know, you're being biased, that would be a huge step forward. And, and if the journalist, can't be the arbiter of truth, can't tell the American people what is fact and what is fiction, then who's going to do that? Dr. Kennedy, I just want to thank you for, you know, coming today, speaking to us with so much candor, you know, on a day where, you know, so, so many of our hearts are, 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 are so heavy considering everything we've seen in this past year. Um, for Kahde Kiapa, I'm Abu Kamara. Thank you and have a good night. Thank you. All right. Thank you.